This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Christopher McDowell is an ANS fellow and an attorney living in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is the president of the prestigious Colonial Co uh, Coin Collectors Club, known as C4, uh, the editor of the Journal of Early American Numismatics, published by the ANS, Gene. Uh, and before that, he edited the Colonial Newsletter, which is uh, Gene's forerunner. Uh, Mr. McDowell is an ANS fellow and author of uh, Abel Buell and the History of the Connecticut and Fujio Coinages and the Early Betts Metal Companion, Volume 1. Uh, he has completed Volume 2, which will be published soon by the ANS, and is currently working on the final volume of this three-volume uh, series. In addition, he is author of numerous award-winning articles in the area of colonial numismatics. Uh, today, Chris is going to be presenting on the only non-United States uh, topic today uh, with New World Proclamation Medals, uh, an analysis of their design, minting technology, and political importance. Thank you. Let's uh, have a round of applause for Chris McDowell. Thank you. Good, it's working now. When uh, I'm an attorney and when I uh, have cases before a jury, when people's life is on the line, I use blow ups uh, instead of uh, this technology because I always find that it leaves you in the, uh, at the altar. But we got to work in now. Over the course of the last couple of years, I've studied proclamation medals and I have come to appreciate them as the most significant medals produced in the Americas. They are of extreme political importance. Uh, they have great technology that goes into them, which we'll discuss. Uh, and we'll also be talking about their design. These medals are very uh, little known uh, amongst American collectors. And there's a primary reason for that, uh, which is because almost everything written on these proclamation medals is in Spanish. There are three primary works in the area. The only one that is in English is a Groves book, and he, that's the top book, uh, and he just focused on Mexican proclamation medals. The next book in descending order there is Jose Medina's book, which was published in 1917. Uh, he was from Santiago, Chile, uh, and it is entirely in Spanish, and it covers all the proclamation medals. And then the, the first uh, book on this was from Adolfo Herrera, uh, who lived in Madrid. And it was from Herrera that C. Willis Betts got almost all of his information on proclamation medals. Of these three books, the book uh, from Medina is probably the best, but it's over 100 years old and has never been updated. And obviously, in the last hundred years, we found many more proclamation medals, and we know a lot more about medals than obviously we did in 1917. Medina was a polymath. Not only was he into numismatics, but he wrote several other books on a variety of topics. He's been honored on a stamp, as you can see, uh, from Chile. Now, all of those books that I just uh, described, if you were to purchase them all, would cost, uh, would cost you almost $1,000. In my first volume of Betts Medals, I cover the proclamation medals of Philip V and Louis I. The second volume will cover the proclamation medals of Ferdinand VI and Charles III. I intend, once I finish these Betts Medals series, to put out a book on proclamation medals, covering all of the proclamation medals that we, uh, that we know of. So, well, what is a proclamation medal? Probably a lot of you are asking that question, and it's a good question because most Americans, again, have never heard of or know anything about proclamation medals. What do they commemorate? What are their purpose? The primary purpose of a proclamation medal was to acknowledge the new king. So if you were the king of Spain and you had a far-flung empire covering most of the globe, you needed to have good people in positions of authority 
in that empire. You're in Madrid. You've got somebody in Venezuela. You've got somebody in Panama. You may have somebody in the Philippines. You have to know once the new king takes the throne that these people are loyal to you, that they are your loyal subjects, that your empire is intact, that there's nobody who's making a new claim to the throne. We are going to be focusing on New World Proclamation Medals, that is those proclamation medals that were issued in New Spain. However, there were proclamation medals that were issued in Spain itself, as well as in other places. If you look here, this is our first look at a proclamation medal. In the lower left, you have a proclamation medal that was prepared in Spain. And then you have one that was prepared in Mexico City. And you will notice a great similarity in the bust. These are, these are both cast medals. When you look at these very early proclamation medals, they will have a design that incorporates the new king's image on the obverse and usually the escudo or the seal of the city uh, on the reverse. Here's the city of Veracruz. If you look again at the, on the, the medal on the left, you'll see that same image that was uh, for Mexico City and also in Spain. There was a tendency here. Nobody knew in the New World what the new king looked like. And so they just found a coin from Spain and copied that image uh, onto those coins here. Generally, one of the ways to know if a coin, if you don't otherwise are able to tell, is from the New World versus Spain, is generally the kings of Spain during this period died at the end of the year. And so in Spain proper, these would be dated 1700, but in the New World, they're dated 1701. And that same pattern basically will re repeats itself throughout the next four kings. That is, those that are issued in Europe are generally a year before those issued in the New World. And we'll discuss one of the reasons other than time and distance uh, why that is. But this medal here from Veracruz from 1701, to 1808 from uh, to Ferdinand the seventh, you can see the great progress of technology uh, in these metals. It was very important that these metals be the best metal that could be produced at that time and in that place. You are going to present this metal to the king as your token of loyalty to the king. So you wanted it to be the best that it could be. So you see the very sort of crude cast metal uh, that was the best they could make in the new world on the left to 100 years later to a very, very nice struck piece. I am limiting myself in this discussion today to those new world proclamation medals for Spanish kings. One of the things that you should be aware of is after independence, many of these colonial nations continued to issue proclamation medals. This is a proclamation medal uh, directly after independence of Mexico of the new leader of Mexico. And this was very, very common that this would go on uh, in the New World and the Americas, particularly in Bolivia, uh, where they issued proclamation medals into the 20th century. So here you have Simon Bolivar, you have on the reverse of it, a, uh, the mountain of silver and Potosi. It has a very nice edge on it, which we'll also be getting more into in a minute. Well, I mentioned to you what the primary purpose of these proclamation medals was, and that is so that people could show their loyalty to the king. Well, how do they do that? What was what was this ceremony all about, this proclamation ceremony? Really, it is a loyalty oath where everyone, not just the principal persons in the town, but all the primary leaders in the town, the military leaders, they would all gather to swear a new oath of loyalty, fealty to the new king. And th this took place all over the world when there was a new king not just in Spain, but
but all over the world, people would swear an oath publicly to the new king. In Spain, you're swearing this oath to the king. In America, we still have oaths. We're soldiers, this is my son, taking the oath of office to become a United States Army officer. In America, we swear an oath to the Constitution to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. We don't swear oaths of loyalty to an individual person. And that is the great difference between what was going on then and what goes on today. The big person in these proclamation ceremonies was the royal ensign. In the far flung areas of the Spanish Empire, there was a person in every primary city who was called the royal ensign. He was the representative of the king. He stood in for the king in all the ceremonies. Mostly this guy didn't have a lot to do, but when it came down to the proclamation ceremony, he was extraordinarily important. Usually some of them were, uh, they like to wear fancy uniforms, they go around town, and uh, church services could not begin until they sat down, but in the proclamation ceremony, they were front and center. So here is a brief discussion of the proclamation ceremony uh, that took place uh, in Buenos Aires, and you can read that while I discuss it. So these proclamation ceremonies, these loyalty oath ceremonies, were not one or two hour affairs. They were big events. One of the reasons why the proclamation ceremonies in the Americas took place more than a year later is because they had to plan for these events. These events took many months of planning. They were several day long affairs. In Mexico City, for example, they would spend the equivalent of millions of dollars for these events. And they would always culminate uh, in the loyalty oath ceremony. So everyone would par parade through the town led by the royal ensign. They would climb a platform in the town square and there raise their hand and swear an oath to the new king. After they did that, someone would reach into a basket and throw the medals to the crowd. This is the medal from the proclamation ceremony that you were just reading about from 1747 in Buenos Aires. So these, this medal and all the proclamation medals that we have were thrown to the crowd. So they were given to the people. The people were required to attend these ceremonies under penalty of criminal sanction. So if you were a farmer living many miles away from the city center, you were required to attend. And if you did not attend, you could be rounded up uh, and punished. And so I guess to salve that wound in some respect, they threw these proclamation medals to the crowd. The proclamation medal was a central aspect of the event, of the loyalty ceremony. So these were medals that were made for the people to be thrown to the people. A special sample of each would have been sent to the king in Madrid to, along with the letter explaining what happened that day and how the medals were thrown into the crowd. Now, if you were a peasant who happened to catch one of these medals, it would basically equal a week, two weeks, of your labor. And so these people were very happy to receive it, but not in the way that you might expect, because you'll see that they did not go out and spend them. They were glad to have them. They were almost like a royal uh, a religious talisman. They would hold them. They would put them on a string. They would wear them around their necks. They would carry them in their pockets as, as a uh, sort of a special thing to them because they felt that the king had been ordained by God to rule over them. They did not know what the king looked like except from what they received on these proclamation medals. So they didn't spend them right away. They kept them. They kept them close to themselves. They were very special. So in this respect, proclamation medals are not commemorative medals like we think of 
as all medals, but are in a class of their own. Spanish colonial proclamation medals were not produced to honor a past historical event. Rather, these medals were made to serve as a memento of a current event of historical significance. Proclamation medals were to be given away to the crowd of ordinary citizens that came to watch and participate in the festivities, where the ruling elite swore fealty to the new monarch, also known as the oath ceremony. These medals were given away by throwing them to the crowd, often from the same platform from which the oath had just been taken. So what is the geographic range and region uh, over which proclamation medals were issued? Well, we just saw that there's one from Buenos Aires. So these are being issued from the tip of South America, also to North America. Jesse, when he introduced me, said this was the only topic that was not uh, an American numismatic topic, but there is uh, one, at least one, a proclamation medal that was issued in America, in North America, and that is the St. Augustine uh, cast proclamation medal. These were again issued all over the world. Here's one uh, that was uh, struck uh, in the Philippines. So what medals were used to make these medals? That is medals with a T. What medals were used to make these medals? Well, the most common metal used was silver. Uh, by far, uh, the most proclamation medals are in silver, at least 80% or more. Also, some are found in bronze. Still others are gilt bronze. So these are going from the order of most common to least common. And the rarest would be gold. Uh, this is a proclamation medal that was issued in Puerto Rico in 1747. And it's uh, uh, unique and it's actually here at the American Numismatic Society in its collection. It has the seal of the island of Puerto Rico on the reverse. Uh, also, you'll see there's a lots of religious imagery that goes along with this. Because remember, again, the king is being ordained by God to rule over his people. Well, who was issuing these medals? The medals that we've discussed and the most common issuance of these medals was from the city itself and the officials of that city itself. So every prominent city in the New World, from Buenos Aires to Mexico City in particular, uh, to uh, big cities uh, in Puerto Rico and, and, and elsewhere, issued these medals. If a city could issue a proclamation medal, if they had the ability to issue a proclamation medal, they issued one. Early on, proclamation medals are primarily cast, except in those areas in which there is an existing mint. So in Mexico City, you'll find that they were struck, but in other areas, you'll find that they were cast. As time goes on, they all become struck. But in addition to city officials, others issued proclamation medals as well. Earlier, I talked about the Royal Ensign. One of the things that in many areas the Royal Ensign did was he used his own money to make proclamation medals. And when the, when the Royal Ensign did this, he put his name on the proclamation medal. So the reverse uh, on this proclamation medal has a name, Mr. Uh, Mendoza, and this was the Royal Ensign for this area. So he's spending his own money to make a proclamation medal, to throw the proclamation medal to the crowd. He puts his own name on this proclamation medal, and then he's gonna send a special version of the proclamation medal to the king, to let the king know that he is particularly loyal to the king. And it was considered a great honor on his part to be able to spend his own money 
to curry favor with the king to put his own name on this medal, and he wanted everybody to know it. Here we have a discussed, uh, this is the medal from St. Augustine. This is the cast 1760 Charles III proclamation medal. This is again the only uh, one or the earliest one made in the Americas. Here we have a name of someone on the reverse of this medal. Uh, it is uh, Mr. Pena. And if you go to St. Augustine today, his house still stands. Mr. Pena was not the royal ensign of the city, but he was the royal treasurer of St. Augustine. And he made, we can only assume that he paid for and made, had made the 1760 St. Augustine Proclamation Medal because he had his name uh, put on the back of it. It's the only reason why his name really would be on it. So why would the, well, the royal treasurer want to do this? Well, again, he wants to show that he is loyal to the new king. You know, king, you can trust me. I am loyal to you. And therefore, when a new position comes open somewhere, maybe in Havana, a little nicer than St. Augustine, you might want to appoint me to that new position, which is exactly what happened to Mr. Pena. Shortly after uh, this proclamation medal was made, he was elevated to a better royal position in Havana, Cuba. And here's one from Havana, Cuba. Uh, that has uh, a name on it as well. Again, this is the Royal Ensign. And again, also, you see a mixture between the Escudo or the seal, the official seal on the reverse of Havana, Cuba, uh, and also the Royal Ensign's name on it. If you were paying attention, you might have recognized some similarities between the obverse of this medal. This 1760 St. Augustine cast proclamation medal shares a very similar obverse with two other cast medals from Cuba. I am of the opinion that the 1760 cast St. Augustine proclamation medal is authentic. One of the six or seven ways that I believe that it is authentic is because it closely matches other known proclamation medals being issued in that era. You can also see when you look at the two Cuban ones, how they are hold. Again, these were considered very dear to the people who captured them. So those would have been hold and worn around the neck, most likely carried as a talisman for the person who caught it. Amongst the other organizations, interestingly, that issued proclamation medals in this instance in 1809. This is some two years after the new king has taken the throne. These are the indigenous tribesmen or uh, people of uh, Central America. Those chiefs issued a proclamation medal in silver and had it sent to the king in Spain. For them, they wanted to show again their loyalty to the new king, to let the new king know, we, the indigenous conquered people of your new realm, also swear fealty and loyalty to you. You can trust us also. So you can see the extraordinary political significance of these medals, unlike any other medal we know of. In Spain, in the new world in this period there was very little difference between the state and religion the this is uh, a 1760 proclamation medal charles the third again being issued by the bishop of guadalajara so not only is it citizens of the of the new world but also the bishop uh, here of guadalajara he wants the king to know that he personally is also loyal to the new king. So while the bishop may not have, like the other persons, stood on the raised dais, the raised platform in the city center, raised his hand and swore a loyalty oath to the new king, 
he issued this medal and had it sent to the king so the king knows that he also is loyalty loyal to the king well why would he do that well the king of spain had great influence over who became bishop of what city and what area so when a greater larger bishopric becomes open maybe he would like to get that and so he wants the king to know i'm loyal to you as well because there is such a close relationship here between church and state spain is conquering the new world in part one for money but also for a religious purpose to spread catholicism to spread christianity to the new world the king wants people in place in the new world who are on his side who won't foment revolution against the king because when revolution eventually does come in Mexico and throughout the New World, it is often religious persons who are behind or fomenting some of that turmoil against the king. So it's very important for the king that he know who his friends are in the New World and throughout the world. So again, something that we wouldn't think of, but this is an official bishop issuing a proclamation medal to give to the king. This particular one is issued in uh, uh, silver, bronze, gold plate. Uh, so it is issued in, in several different medals. More often than not, a proclamation medal would be issued only in one medal, but there are some that were issued in multiple medals with a T medal. Here is Mexico City University also swearing letting the king know that they are loyal to the king these medals that are being made in and around mexico city are all being made at the official mexico city mint uh, it was uh, common if you could reach the mint that you would hire or pay the mint to make the medal for you if you could if you were in a far-flung area a very royal rural area they may be forced to cast or make the metal some other way other than striking the metal but those who could those who could afford it would pay the mint to make the metal for them so here is uh there were two men who were working at the mexico city mint in or in and around 1760 so these were the official employees and engravers of the mint this is one of them madero he makes the uh the punch or the bust uh, of the king for the 1760 mexico city eight escudo as you can see on the left so this is a coin that he makes and then he takes that same bust and he puts it on a proclamation medal which you can see uh, on the right The other person who's working at the uh, Mexico City Mint in 1760 is Casanova. Uh, and he and uh, Maduro are very accomplished engravers and they make some really, really nice uh, medals, proclamation medals during this time. So this was sort of their side gig. So they would be able to make money on the side engraving and preparing proclamation medals and then using the official Mexico City mints equipment to make the proclamation medals. And this went on not just in Mexico City, but also other cities in which there was an official royal mint. So since die making was expensive and time consuming, and since mints were far and few between, it was normal for Spanish colonial towns to make proclamation medals from casting molds rather than striking. Uh, and again, as time goes on, you find more and more that are struck. But here is a very crude metal from the Yucatan. So uh, I visited the Yucatan about, uh, about two and a half months ago. Even today, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico is rather remote. In 1724, I can only imagine how remote it was. But yet, these people living in the Yucatan wanted the king of Spain to know that they also had had a proclamation ceremony and that they were also loyal to the king, but they did not have the technology to make a nice 
metal like Mexico City. So this is what they came up with. It's rather interesting and, and beautiful in its own folk art kind of way. Now let's look at Santa Fe de Bogota. Bogota uh, is uh, a, a very important city, but in 1724, here is the medal that they proclamation medal produced in that city for the proclamation of Louis the first. As you can see, this is a very crude sort of proclamation medal because they didn't have the technology to do any better. In 1747, in Bogota, it's the same way. Again, they're forced to prepare a rather crude proclamation medal. One of the things that I should mention is that for these early proclamation medals, those from uh, uh, Philip V, Louis I, Ferdinand VI, these medals are very rare. Generally, the extent of any particular medal may be no more than five or six, although there were many produced for each city, you're only looking at maybe four, five, six, or maybe even the metal is unique. So there are very, very few of these older metals uh, around today. When you get into 1760 and beyond, you'll have more and more metals. And as obviously, as you get closer to the uh, 19th and 20th century, there'll be many more. But these are all very rare metals. So then in 1760, what does Bogota get? Bogota gets an official mint. And here is the screw press that Bogota received. Basically, all these places get the hand-me-downs from Mexico City. So they get a new minting screw press and they get an official mint. So we can expect, again, they wanna make the best proclamation medal they can. So in 1760, we have a much nicer proclamation medal. And one of the common things that you also see is that in those cities that have an official mint, they're, they're, they're using the same planchets, they're using the same technology, the same equipment uh, that they were using to make coins with. And we have here in 1760, uh, this nice edge also on this coin, or I'm sorry, metal. What? Guatemala was another city that was rather remote, but they had a mint too. So in Guatemala, it's rather interesting because they make their proclamation medals in the same sizes that they also are making coins with. So here we have a four reale size proclamation medal in 1760, uh, also in 1747. And then it also goes to a two, one, and a half. Uh, and these metals from Guatemala, uh, they made a lot of them, uh, but you can see this one is pierced. It was also kept and worn, uh, but these are more common uh, than maybe some of the other ones you see because they're being made by the mint, but they're being made in, in great abundance, but they're also being made in the same sizes and weights uh, that the coinage was being made. One of the other things that's interesting is the, uh, the horsemen uh, on these Guatemalan medals who's jumping from mountain peak, volcanic peak back and forth. He goes one way for one king and then he goes the other way uh, for the next king back and forth uh, he goes. So here, is a proclamation medal for 1789, eight reale size, but not only is it that size, but if you look on the reverse, it says eight R on it. So now we have a real mixing of metal and coin. So it's the same size, the same weight uh, as a coin that's being made at the Mexico City Mint, and it actually says eight R on the back. Here's one, same year, two R on the back. So it's a very, it's a blend. So these proclamation medals, they really kind of cut the line between what is a medal and what is a coin. 
Uh, they, they live in, they have a foot in both worlds. As time goes on in the new world, not only does the minting equipment become more sophisticated, uh, but also uh, more, more technically proficient engravers arrive at the new world to work at these various mints. They get away from having the simple imagery of the king on the obverse and the royal seal for the town on the reverse. Here is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a 1761, so you can see this is actually being issued two years after the king takes the throne. It's not being issued uh, by a city, but rather by the mining area that's in this area, a very wealthy mining area. It was not uncommon for these large mines to issue their own proclamation medals. They have a royal um, uh, uh, decree that allows them to mint the company as an official sort of royal company. This is all part of an operation that's being heavily regulated by the Spanish government. But the mine also wants the king to know that they are loyal. So this mine obviously has lots of silver. The proclamation medal is made in silver. They have a lot of money. So they hire the engraver, the official engraver Casanova from the Mexico Mint to, in my opinion, make his greatest metal, which is this with this wonderful, wonderful uh, design on the reverse. Uh, it comes from Greek mythology in the story. Uh, the Greek king uh, hears that his daughter is going to have a baby and that that child will grow and kill him. So he imprisons his daughter in a, uh, uh, in a room so that she can't Mary, she can't be with any men, and Apollo comes to her at night and showers her with gold, sort of a golden shower, and from that uh, she conceives a child, and the child grows and kills the king. So here we have sort of a reverse. We have her showering gold or coins on the mountain from which the silver is coming. She's sort of seeding that mountain it's it's a wonderful wonderful image it's very beautiful different from what you see otherwise also we get into in 1789 we have here a medal on the reverse a proclamation medal that's showing the indigenous people of this area near santiago cuba or chile santiago chile not cuba um, this is one of the few new world medals that actually depicts people, common people, doing ordinary things uh, on the back of a proclamation medal or any medal of this, of this period. And this is being made at the official mint in Santiago, Cuba. Very different. Uh, and you, know, you can see not only the people, but the animals, the plants uh, of the New World being depicted on this medal. It's a very high quality medal. Again, mines were uh, apt to, if they could, make proclamation medals to give to the king. Here is one that's showing mining activity, silver mining activity inside the mine. So here you have the workers on the reverse doing sort of their everyday things. It's a little snapshot in time of what it was like to work in a Spanish silver mine in the New World. Once again, letting the king know this mine and these people are loyal to you. If you recall when I had the uh, image of Simon Bolivar from uh, Bolivia, uh, he had that mountain of, in Potosi uh, on the back of that proclamation medal. Here is a proclamation medal from Potosi in Bolivia. Uh, it's, uh, you can see the outside of the mine on this one and the reverse is 
talking about uh, the proclamation, how they are swearing loyalty. It was, of course, very important to the king that an area like this remain loyal to him because this mountain of silver produced you know, a significant percentage of all the silver ever mined in the world. So this is a brief overview of proclamation medals. I wanted to inform, I guess, the audience first uh, of what proclamation medals were. Instead of taking a deep dive into a particular proclamation medal, I think it's important that we introduce proclamation medals as a subject to an American audience, an English-speaking audience. Uh, and I hope over the next couple of years to produce in English a uh, memory and a writing down of all the proclamation medals that were being issued in the new world during this period. So it can be now a subject open to uh, everyone here in the audience, not just those who may happen to speak in Spanish, uh, which has really, in my opinion, slowed the growth and the collecting of these historically significant medals over the last couple of hundred years. With that, that's my last so slide. So I can take any questions anybody may have about proclamation medals. Lynn. So <clears throat> were these just issued in, in conjunction with um, a new king or might they come like sometime in the middle of a king's reign to you know uh, commemorate fealty or some other reason? Probably the, the question was, if uh, so I could hear, uh, were these just issued when the new king initially came onto the throne or might they be issued in the middle of his reign and so forth? They were probably 95% issued uh, at the beginning of his reign or as soon as the proclamation ceremonies could get underway. In the, in the most remote areas of Mexico uh, and in South America, the, the ceremony and the medal may be dated two years afterwards because it took that long for the news to arrive to the town. But for the most part, the town was expected to organize and have this loyalty oath ceremony as quickly as they could. Uh, and so most of them are dated within the first year or two of the king's reign. In, in Spain proper, they were within months of the new king taking the throne, sometimes maybe out a year, but generally as quickly as possible. There are some, as we saw, from uh, some of those mines that were issued a little later, that is those that were issued by entities that did not directly participate in the loyalty ceremony like the bishop uh, or a silver mine, those may be issued a little later post the proclamation ceremony, uh, but they weren't things that were issued you know, four or five years into the king's reign because the king wanted to know right away who his men were, who he could, uh, who, who he could count on, and those people wanted the king to know right away, I'm your man here in Santiago, you can count on me. So for the most part, 95% issued immediately upon the king taking the throne. Yes, sir, you want to give him the mic? What's the earliest uh, dated uh, proclamation medal issued in the New World? 17, uh, those that I showed you there, 1701 are the first, are the first ones. Harara uh, has, uh, there were indications that some were going to be issued earlier than that, and there are drawings of them uh, in Spain, uh, but they were not actually, there's no evidence that they were actually struck or cast. So the earliest ones are 1701 uh, in the New World. So they basically range from 1701 to 1808, 1809, uh, because that's when the, uh, uh, Ferdinand VII took the throne. By the time the next king takes the throne, independence has occurred throughout most of uh, the Americas. And so they're not Spanish, but Bolivia and some of those other countries continue to issue proclamation medals after that period. So we're mostly looking at a period here between 1701 and 1808. Uh, my focus is primarily on the New World. Uh, I think that it is, it is though, pretty close to about the same uh, time frame, uh, th these, these medals. Yeah, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, Chris, first off, uh, great job. Fascinating subject. You're my new hero. I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> um, 
I noticed that you mentioned, you know, each one of these proclamation medals struck in whatever particular locale would send an example to the king. So somewhere in Spain, is there a royal numismatic cabinet that's got the ultimate set of American proclamation medals? There are two um, museums in Mexico City uh, that have the uh, largest collections of proclamation medals, including New World proclamation medals. They don't have every one of them. Uh, you would have thought, uh, as I have been looking for this uh, honey hole of proclamation medals in Madrid, uh, but they, uh, there's no one location. Mostly they're split between, I think it's a Museum of Archaeology and the uh, um, uh, Museum of Spanish Official Historical Museum uh, in Madrid. Uh, my supposition is that at some point, uh, uh, some king or some revolution occurred and they, they were distributed. Uh, so they're no longer part of sort of a royal collection that you might have like the King of England yeah. or king of belgium or what have you so they're there but there are two primary museums in madrid which i would love to go see and that's where herrara who was in madrid who wrote the book that betts got most of his information from herrara got most of his information from those two museums thank you no problem any other questions neil has a question earlier in the presentation you had uh with the uh the uh, Florida medal, the uh, St. Augustine, you, you showed three medals on a slide, two of them with holes, and talked about the significance of them being worn with holes. Any possibility you could go back to that slide? There is a possibility. <laughs> in, in, in theory, there's well, a possibility. Well, the, my, question is, my question is that if the, the importance of wearing and holding that medal close to your heart or keeping it on your person, the holes seem to be placed rather haphazardly. And in a later slide, the holes were placed carefully at the top. But in that earlier slide, the, the holes were very haphazard. And I wonder if something else was going on there. Yeah, we'd have to see the reverse. So it may, oh, okay. it may align with the reverse, okay. Okay. with the, um, uh, the shield of the city of Havana, rather than okay. the king's image, uh, it, it may, more closely aligned with that, I'd have to 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 see. Um, but yeah, you find many of these, although not very many of the images that I showed had holes in it. It's further back. Uh, there are most of the proclamation medals that you see, particularly of Guatemala, uh, are hold. Let me see. Let me see if I can take control and get back to that image for you without making everyone too dizzy. There it is. There you go. Yeah, I would have to look at the at the reverse. I'm not, seems like maybe he's hanging a little sideways. I agree with you. We have another question. Yeah, actually, it's two comments. One, for the holes from here, it just looks like they're trying to not puncture the king's face, which could be. Yeah. But uh, the comment really is that earlier you said that these were not historic medals; they were contemporary. Uh, record, so to speak, and they're unique in that regard. But it seems to me that they're very similar to early English coronation medals when James I introduced them uh, as part of the royal largesse, his obligation to throw money to the crowds. And he found it was cheaper to make a small medal than to give a larger coin. <laughs> but in, so in that regard, they actually weren't commemoratives. But again, this type of thing, it was used for a particular ceremony, but no other reason, really. Yeah, I, I would agree. They they would seem to have a lot of a lot in common with coronation uh, medals and things being thrown to to the people to the crowd. Uh, although there there are many of these that are are large size, eight reale as you saw sized, um, and some of them are very rarely in gold, and some are in in bronze, uh, which seems to me sort of a cheap way to do it as well to throw bronze medals to uh, to the crowd. Chris, we have one uh, question online that's right behind you. Uh, you showed two proclamation medals of Louis uh, the I, 1724, who had very short reign. Are yeah. his proclamation medals rare? Yeah, all, all the, the Louis I proclamation medals are extraordinarily rare. Um, they're, 
They, they also, um, as time goes on, uh, when you look at Philip V, maybe we have five different cities that issue proclamation medals in the New World. And then for Louis the First, you might have eight. Uh, by the time you get to 1760 and Charles the Third, and you get to Ferdinand the the Sixth and Ferdinand the Seventh, you find that there are, there are dozens and dozens. And then you know almost any city of any consequence also is making a proclamation medal. So one Louis the First is rare because there aren't very many extant, but also because there weren't very many cities at that time that were able to make a medal of any sort. So the Louis the First, Philip the Fifth medals are very rare, if for no other reason than for that, because there were just very few cities that did it. And whenever you look at almost any city absent uh, Guatemala uh, or Mexico City, there are very few medals that survive from any particular city or person of variety. So yes, uh, Dave, uh, Louis the First are very rare. If you happen to have one, we can talk. <laughs> Any Anyone other? else have a question? Well, good. All right. Good then. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Fred.